Ezekiel 33.3. Welcome, everyone, and happy Hanukkah. Uh, actually, we're recording this at the time of Hanukkah. Hanukkah is also known as the Festival of Lights and the Feast of Dedication. The many names of Hanukkah, Hanukkah or Chanukkah, Feast of Dedication, Festival of Lights. It's also known as the Feast of Maccabees. And Maccabees is actually where you find the details of Hanukkah. So first, we're going to take a look at the nine holy days of the Bible. So you're going to see the complete list of all the holy days that are written in the Old and New Testament. We've got Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, Feast of First Fruits, Feast of Weeks, which is also known as Pentecost or in Hebrew Shavuot, Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, also known as Yom Kippur, Feast of Tabernacles, also known as Sukkot, and Feast of Booths or Feast of Tents. We've got the Feast of Dedication, which is what we're studying today, also known as Hanukkah or Chanukkah. And then the Feast of Lots, also known as Purim. So if you take a look, you can see here's the Hebrew calendar. Uh, the year starts in the month of Nisan, used to be called the month of Abib. You'll find that as the Israelites were uh, held in captivity by different nations, some of their months had changed. Uh, Nisan is an example. Tammuz is another example, which you can see there around June, July. So there's four holy days practiced in the New Testament. At least you can see them. The Passover, it's mentioned in 1 Corinthians 5, 6. The Feast of Unleavened Bread, that's in Acts 12, 3. There's the Feast of Weeks, which is also known as Pentecost. That's in Acts 2. That's when they were speaking in tongues. And then the Feast of Dedication, also known as Hanukkah. We see that in the book of John, chapter 10, verse 22. So which holidays should we keep? Well, in the Old Testament, in Leviticus 23, there were six holidays, holy days, commanded for all generations. Those holy days were the Feast of Weeks, the Feast of First Fruits, the Day of Atonement, the Feast of Tabernacles, Passover, and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So six of these days were given, or seven of these days were actually given by God in Leviticus uh, 23, but six of the days given by God in Leviticus 23 were commanded to be kept for all generations. So three of these we could actually see after the crucifixion of Christ. So if we actually go back a slide here, if we take a look, Passover, that's in 1 Corinthians, that's after the cross. Uh, Book of Acts 12 and 2, that's after the cross. And then the Feast of Dedication, this is where Christ actually was uh, near the temple during the Feast of Dedication. So three of these, Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread, and Feast of Weeks, these were all taking place after the cross. And these three were also mentioned as being kept for all generations. So it's pretty safe to assume that if we can see three in the New Testament being kept uh, going forward in time, it's pretty safe to say the other ones were as well. So six were commanded for all generations. The one that's missing from this list here is actually the Feast of Trumpets. Uh, the Feast of Trumpets wasn't in the list of uh, holy days that was commanded for all generations. And then out of the uh, seven that were given by God, there were two that are called minor holy days. And the minor holy days were the ones that the Israelites or the Jews had come up with. Uh, those two holy days would be Purim and Hanukkah, the Feast of Dedication. So as I mentioned, we have our minor holy days. Minor holy days fall in the cooler parts of the year. So if you take a look, you can see uh, right around Kislev, um, we've got the Feast of Dedication, Hanukkah, and then we've got the Feast of Lot's Purim in the month of Adar. So these holy days are in the cooler parts of the year, and these weren't commanded by God to keep. These were holy days that were actually created by man. So if you read, for example, uh, the book of Esther, you'll see where Purim comes from and then Hanukkah, the book of Maccabees. So these weren't given by God, these were actually created by men. And you'll find the seven that were given by God all fall in the warmer half of the year. So the six holy days of the warmer months are the commanded months, or sorry, the six holy days of the warmer months are the commanded holidays. The origins of Hanukkah. So first off, let's look at the books of the Bible. We're going to look at the Protestant Bible because there is a variation when we look at the Catholic Vulgate or the Latin Vulgate. Protestant Bible has 66 books. It's composed of 39 books making up the Old Testament and then 27 books making up the New Testament. The Catholics, it's a little bit different. Uh, looking at an old Catholic Vulgate, you'll have 46 books. So there's like a seven additional books in there. It's not that there's actually seven additional books. It's more so that the way that the books are divided are slightly different. 
Uh, there was a book or a series of books called the Apocrypha, which sat between the Old and the New Testament. Uh, the Apocrypha was about 14 books between the Old and the New Testament. And the reason why you look in the Latin Vulgate and you'll see that there's more books is because some of the books from the Apocrypha were actually not uh, in the Apocrypha and the Vulgate, but they were actually just part of the Catholic Bible itself. So, for example, the book of Maccabees, if you were to open up a Protestant Bible with the 66 books and compare that to a Catholic Vulgate, you'll find that the Catholics have a book called the book of Maccabees, which is missing from the Protestant Bible, unless you look in the Apocrypha. Now, interestingly enough, the Apocrypha was in the 1611 King James Bible. So if you have an original King James Bible, or if you've seen the original 1611 King James Bible, which is available on archive.org, you'll notice that the Apocrypha sat in between the Old and New Testament. So once you reach Malachi, between Malachi and Matthew, you found these books called the Apocrypha. This is actually a picture of the book of First Esdras. It's the first book of the Apocrypha. So you can see here we're ending at Malachi. So the Old Testament's coming to an end. And now we're moving into the Apocrypha. And then after the Apocrypha, you would see the book of Matthew. The Apocrypha contains the books of First and Second Esdras, Tobit, Judith, the rest of Esther. Uh, as a matter of fact, when you read the book of Esther, it kind of seems like it just cuts off. But uh, the rest of Esther is in the Apocrypha. Wisdom or Wisdom of Solomon. Ecclesiasticus, also known as the Book of Sirach, Baruch, the Song of the Three Children, Story of Susanna, the Idol Bell and the Dragon, the Prayer of Manasseh, and what we'll be looking at today is First and Second Maccabees, because our details for Hanukkah, they come specifically from these two books. Hanukkah is also known as the Feast of Weeks or Pentecost. You can actually see it written in Second Maccabees 1232. There are other... Um, Oh, my apologies. You can see the Feast of Weeks, sorry, written in 2 Maccabees 1232, uh, also known as Pentecost. It's not the only holy day that's mentioned in the book of Maccabees. You can also find Purim. Purim is mentioned in 2 Maccabees 1536, and the Feast of Tabernacles is mentioned in Maccabees 10 uh, verses 1 to 8. We're going to quickly take a look at the genealogy of Adam. We're going to go from Adam to the flood, and then we're going to carry on from there, just to give you a quick overview. So if we look at Adam and Eve, we start off our story in the Garden of Eden. Once they're kicked out, they have their children, Cain and Abel. Cain then kills Abel. We're going to focus on the lineage going through Seth. From Seth, we have Enosh. Enosh is an important one. I highlighted it because uh, in Genesis 4.26, something strange happens. You can't necessarily catch it in the English translations, but you can if you read the Hebrew. You'll notice in Genesis 4.26, it's the first time you actually see the name of the Lord. Uh, Lord, as in Y-H-W-H, Yahweh, Jehovah, first time that shows up is right in 426. Interesting fact, though, is when you take a look at the 1611 King James Version, you will find out in Genesis 426 that during the days of Enosh, they did not proclaim the name of the Lord. You had people starting to call themselves by the name of the Lord. So they made themselves into an idol. But again, if you take a look at the 1611 King James Version, you'll find that in the side notes. Uh, Genesis 6, 4, uh, days of Jared. This is very important. This is when the sons of God came unto the daughters of man. These are known as uh, Benai Elohim, the sons of God. Uh, we'll cover that more in another study, but just another important point to keep note of when you're looking at the lineages. And then we have Noah introduced in Genesis 6, 8. And this is where we have the flood, where we have Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and their wives enter an ark, and everyone else in the world is destroyed. On the other side of the ark, uh, we start to see the table of nations. So Japheth, uh, this would represent pretty much Europe and Asia. As a matter of fact, if you're familiar with Javan, Javan or the Javites, uh, that would point you back to the original Greeks. You can actually tell that because if you're familiar with the word Kittim, Kittim or Chittim is a word that is still used today to refer to Cyprus and Greece. We've got Ham, the Hamites. They were supposed to reside in Africa. And then we have Shem. Uh, Shem is the line we're going to focus on, and we're going to follow it right down to Abram. Abram at 90 years old becomes Abraham. If we go down the bloodline of Abraham, we eventually get to Isaac and then Jacob. And then Jacob, who is renamed Israel, has 12 sons, the 12 tribes of Jacob or the 12 tribes of Israel. And today we'll be focusing on the Levites. And from the Levites, we get Moses and we have the high priest Aaron. We have the story of let my people go during the time of the Exodus. We're going to benchmark this at around 1500 B.C. Following this, Moses receives the law. So as they leave Egypt and then Moses goes on the mountain, he receives the law. He also receives uh, instructions for how to build the tabernacle. 
they build their tabernacle and they move around in the wilderness with this movable tabernacle, which is supposed to be a reflection of basically the kingdom in heaven. Here is a breakdown of Israel uh, once the 12 tribes settled into Israel. So we can see that each one of the 12 sons had taken an area. Around 957 BC, we had the building of Solomon's temple. So now we're no longer using the movable tents. Now we have a stationary temple. We see a split between the north and the south of Israel. The kingdom of Israel is the north. Kingdom of Judah is the south. And this had to do with basically a change in a king and obviously issues or and issues with worship. Uh, basically, the north kingdom was fed up with the rulership that they were under. They split and they basically set up their own temple service in Bethel with a golden calf. Eventually, what you find is that the northern kingdom is taken captive and then the southern kingdom following. If you take a look, the purple lines, this is the first captivity. This is the captivity into Assyria. So you can see here they were taken around the Tigris River here uh, to Nineveh in Assyria. And then there was a second captivity. The second captivity was Babylon. That's when the southern kingdom was taken. The southern kingdom was taken to Babylon, and then eventually they made it back towards uh, Jerusalem. And then they started to build another temple. So the Babylonian Empire was from around 606 BC to 536 BC. Babylon was then conquered by the Persian Empire, and this is when the Jews eventually went back to build their temple, 539 BC to 331 BC. The Seleucid Empire, or the Greeks, 312 BC to 63 BC, and this is where we're really going to be looking at our story. So the timeline leading up to the Maccabees, 587 BC, the Jerusalem temple was destroyed, and that's when we saw the Jews get taken into Babylon. 539 BC, Persia defeats Babylon. And the Jews are allowed to go back to Israel. As a matter of fact, uh, Donald Trump was compared to King Cyrus because Cyrus gave the order to allow the Jews to go back and then start building. 331 BC, we have Alexander the Great, the Macedonian. He defeats the Persians. And then Alexander dies. His generals fight for power. Three kingdoms emerge. We've got Egypt, the Ptolemies, uh, Asia Minor, the Seleucids, and then the Macedonians. And then 311 to 164 BC, the Seleucids rule over Israel. So we have a Greek empire that's ruling over Israel at this period of time. And this is where our story begins. We're going to be taking a look at the book of Maccabees and then grabbing some details to formulate the story of Hanukkah. So the Seleucid Empire, 312 BC to 63 BC, and this is when Rome took over. We're going to take a look at Judas Maccabeus. He was the leader at that period of time. And Judas Maccabeus, when you take a look at the lineage, he is the son of Matthias. And you'll see Judas Maccabeus is coming through the line of the priesthood. So the Levites were the high priests. Uh, they were the ones that were responsible for the temple service, maintaining and moving the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, here we can see that the Maccabeans are actually high priests, which would mean we're dealing with Levites. Judas Maccabeus. He was a second century military commander who was the major figure behind the conquest of the Hasmonean or Maccabean revolt that established Jewish sovereignty over the state of Israel. He made an agreement with Rome and became ally, tying the hands of the weaker Seleucid Empire. He is a figure that stands for religious liberty and the standing for rights of religious expression for many Christian persecuted societies. He died in the Battle of Elassa in 160 BC. Another character we need to look at in the story is King Antiochus Epiphanes. And I just want to point out here, this is the Temple Mount today. Uh, this is Israel. So on the Temple Mount, this is the Al-Aqsa Mosque. The Al-Aqsa Mosque is actually where the old temple used to reside. So first we had the Temple of Solomon. Temple of Solomon was destroyed when Babylon came and took the Israelites captive. They built a second temple that was called Zerubbabel's Temple. Uh, and sometimes you'll see it referred to as Herod's Temple after the renovations. Basically here, if you take a look at the Al-Aqsa Mosque, this is where the temple used to reside. So basically after the temple was destroyed the second time in 70 AD, eventually Islam took conquest of the Temple Mount and then the Al-Aqsa Mosque was built. But it was built after this other, uh, I, I guess this would be called a tribute. Uh, this isn't actually a mosque. For years I thought this was a mosque. It's actually a tribute. Uh, there's a story actually involving Muhammad in the Quran flying on some kind of a pegasus and then landing here. So the mosque is actually back here. This is the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Uh, the tribute was built first and then the mosque came second. 
So here is a modern day depiction of what Solomon's temple would have looked like. This is a 3D rendering. Inside of Solomon's temple, what happened was in the most holy place in the book of Maccabees, you read that Antiochus and the Greeks or the Seleucids had placed an idol in the holy place. So the idol they had placed was the idol of Zeus. Uh, Zeus, you can see here holding the lightning bolt. Uh, Zeus was actually worshipped quite a bit in Asia. He went by different names. Jupiter was the name by the Romans. Zeus was the name by the Greeks, but he has many other names outside of that. As a matter of fact, if you read the book of Revelations, you'll find that Zeus himself is who Christ referred to as Satan, or at least one of the names of Satan. We know this because when we take a look in Revelations and we read about the church of Pergamum, Pergamum is where Satan's throne resided. And at that time in Pergamum, the god that was being worshipped, it was many gods, but the chief god at that time was Zeus. There was an altar of Zeus built at Pergamum, which they eventually moved into Berlin, Germany. In 1 Maccabees 144 to 50, we can actually read about what happened to the Jews in revolving this uh, problem of worship. The king, Antiochus uh, Epiphanes, uh, sent letters by messenger to Jerusalem and to the cities of Judah, ordering them to follow customs foreign to their land. Okay, so here we can see that the king, this Greek king, he wants the Jews to basically shy away from their original customs and practice. So in other words, pick up the customs and traditions of the nation you're now conquered or living in. To prohibit burnt offerings, sacrifices, and libations in the sanctuary, to profane the Sabbaths and the feast days. Important detail here, we can see that they kept the Sabbath. The Sabbath was kept uh, right up into the times before Christ, so that would be uh, on Saturday. To desecrate the sanctuary and the sacred ministries, to build pagan altars and temples and shrines, to sacrifice swine and unclean animals. Let me just point this out. Inside of the temple, there were only certain animals that could be offered as a sacrifice. For example, you cannot take a pig and sacrifice a pig. A pig is an unclean animal, and unclean animals weren't used for temple sacrifices. So here we can see basically what this Greek leader is doing is he's making the Jews profane all of their customs and try to basically undo their religion. So you can see that there's uh, altars and there's improper sacrifice, basically just profaning everything that had to do with the Jewish God. In 48, we read, to leave their sons uncircumcised, uh, Jews would circumcise their children on the eighth day. So clearly this was obviously an issue that was being challenged. And to defile themselves with every kind of impurity and abomination, so that they might forget the law and change all of its ordinances. Whoever refused to act according to the command of the king was to be put to death. So the whole purpose of this was actually Antioch uh, Antiochus Epiphanes had this idea that he thought, if I can remove Jewish nationalism, I can basically have them blend in with this empire and stop rebelling, stop revolting, stop fighting because of their pride. So if you take a look on this coin here, we can see the leader on one side of the coin, but on the other side of the coin, that's actually Zeus. We can see Zeus sitting down here. So it shouldn't be surprising that we find later in Maccabees that there was a statue of Zeus put into the holy place, considering that we can see here on the coins of that period of time, we see the leader on the one side and then the god on the other. The Maccabean revolts were from 167 BC to 160 BC, and the Maccabees against the Seleucid Empire and the Hellenistic influence on Jewish life. So this was all about basically trying to remove all this influence that was coming in from the Hellenists, the Greeks, the Seleucid Empire. They're trying to remove that, remove their gods, remove their customs, because they were trying to basically push that onto the Jewish identity. When we take a look here, we can see the Maccabean conquests. There were actually several. Uh, Simon, we see 145 to 132 BC. John Hyrcanus, he comes with quite a bit. Uh, he was quite an important figure to the Jews. As a matter of fact, if I remember correctly, uh, when they were looking for the original burial place of Christ, uh, the Jews had at that time had some animosity with the Christians, and they had pointed them towards the wrong direction in regards to where the grave was. Uh, there was a period of time where people were worshipping what they thought was the grave of Christ, but it actually was the place where most likely John Hieronicus was buried. We also have Aristobulus, 104-103 uh, BC, and then Alexander Janus, 76 BC. So we had a series of different revolts that went on during the Maccabean conquests. So Hanukkah, the rededication of the second temple in Jerusalem. Basically, after the temple was trashed it was destroyed it wasn't decimated to the ground but obviously the insides of it were profane so there was destruction to the inside there were things that were taken um, and 
also the fact that you had this abomination of this idol of Zeus that was placed inside of there. So Hanukkah, the, the reason why it's called the Feast of Dedication is because it's the celebration of the rededicating of the temple. So after the temple was profaned and the menorah had been uh, put out type thing, this was basically getting everything back into uh, working condition again, because up until that time, uh, the only other time that the temple had been uh, profaned like this would have been when the temple was destroyed. So this would have been when the Babylonians came in and basically sacked the temple, destroyed it, and then eventually they went to rebuild the second temple. So this is all about the rededication. So we're celebrating the rededication of the temple with Hanukkah and the cleaning out of all the foreign Greek gods. On the very anniversary of the day the temple was first profaned, the 25th of Kislev, this is exactly when we're celebrating this rededication, he performed a rededication ceremony. It was a party that went on for eight days and a single droplet of oil that should have only lasted for one day lasted for eight days. We're going to talk about that shortly. This is where Hanukkah is also known as the Feast of Dedication because it's based off the rededication of the Jewish temple. It is also known as the Feast of Lights because of a legendary miraculous provision of oil for the eternal light in the temple. So actually this last bullet here is talking what we just briefly looked at in the third bullet. We'll talk about this temple mystery with the oil very shortly. So the significance of the menorah. As a matter of fact, if you take a look at this rock bust here, this is actually taken from the Arch of Titus. After uh, Titus had defeated the Jews uh, and destroyed them, destroyed their second temple in 70 AD, this arch was made and basically you can see here the menorah is situated inside of this arch and you see that there's seven candlesticks. We're going to talk about the miracle of the oil pertaining to the menorah and this idea of why the eight days with the one jar of oil was very special. When the Greeks entered the temple, they polluted all the oils in the temple. So there were oils that they would use for specific things that they would do inside of the temple. So these oils were prepared in a certain way. When the Maccabean army overcame and defeated them, they checked and they found but one cruise of oil that was set in place with the seal of the high priest, but there was only enough in it to last for a single day. So there was oil that was prepared specifically for the menorah. However, after there was all this destruction inside of the temple, there was only one cruise left of oil. Uh, normally, you would have one cruise for each day. So what would happen is after a day, your menorah would go out. This is when the miracle happened. And a little bit of oil lasted for an entire eight days, which was enough time to prepare more oil and keep the menorah continually burning in the temple. So the tradition was they would keep the menorah continually lit. They had oil that they had prepared in the temple that was specifically used for the menorah. Uh, they had one cruise left of oil. Somehow it managed to last for eight days. And this gave the Jews enough time to prepare more oil that they could keep the menorah continually burning. An interesting fact is the first Hanukkah technically wasn't really Hanukkah. Sukkot during Hanukkah. When the Maccabean prevailed over the Syrian Greeks and rededicated the temple, they wanted to get started right away, celebrating important holidays they had missed along the way, including Sukkot, a week-long holiday that should have been celebrated in early autumn. So earlier in the year, uh, there's a festival called the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths, Feast of Tents, Sukkot, the other name, that's the Hebrew name. Sukkot's basically a period of time where you would go out in a tent. Uh, this is supposed to keep memory of what happened with the Jews in the wilderness when they were traveling around with their tabernacle and with their tents. So during the week of Sukkot, what you would do is you would eat within your tent. You basically have all your meals within your tent, but that's a seven-day holiday. What happened was, was during the period of time where the Maccabeans were rivaling with the Greeks, uh, they weren't able to celebrate Sukkot that year. So what ended up happening was Hanukkah was basically the practice of Sukkot. So the Sukkot that they missed that year, instead, they started to practice it during this period of time where the temple rededication happened. So initially, Hanukkah was just a replacement for one Sukkot that they had missed. But now, obviously, we have Sukkot being practiced and we have Hanukkah being practiced. So there's seven days for Sukkot and there's seven days for Hanukkah, but the, or sorry, eight days for, there's, <laughs> there's eight days for Sukkot and eight days for Hanukkah, but the eight days is actually coming from uh, Sukkot because they just basically took that holiday that they missed started to celebrate it, and that's what became Hanukkah.
So despite the fact that it's now early winter, they made an exception and celebrated Sukkot. So Sukkot, usually celebrated in the fall, we're looking at around September, October is usually when it falls. Uh, at this point, they're celebrating it in the winter. Although Sukkot was never again celebrated in the winter, it went back to being a fall holiday. The week-long Sukkot celebration formed the basic time frame for all Hanukkah celebrations thereafter. So the first Hanukkah was really Sukkot, and then following that, they had a separate Sukkot, and they continued this practice of Hanukkah. Feast of Dedication. Although most of the story of Hanukkah is written about in the books between the Old and New Testament, the Feast of Dedication, also known as Hanukkah, was celebrated in Jesus' day. We actually see this in the book of John. So we know that Christ knew of Hanukkah. Uh, we knew that Christ was present at a Hanukkah. We can see it in John 22, 21 to 23. At the time the, of the Feast of Dedication took place in Jerusalem, it was winter and Jesus was walking in the temple courts in Solomon's colonnade. If we take a look here in John 10.22, depending on the translation, sometimes you'll see here, uh, for example, the New Living Translation, it actually does say Hanukkah. In other translations, you'll see Festival of Dedication or Feast of Dedication. But uh, in some translations, you will see that they actually translate Feast of Dedication as Hanukkah. That's why a lot of Christians haven't even noticed that Hanukkah is written in the New Testament. Uh, it just depends on the translation they're reading. For example, if you're reading through the King James Version, King James Version is going to call it the Feast of Dedication. So if you weren't aware that the Feast of Dedication was Hanukkah, you'd keep reading the book of John and not noticing, oh, here's Hanukkah. It's in the New Testament. So why do we celebrate Hanukkah? Hanukkah is a reminder of those who courageously remain faithful to God in the face of persecution. Hanukkah is also a reminder that God is faithful and delivers his people not only from oppression of Antiochus Epiphanes, but also from the oppression of sin and death. So it goes much farther, obviously, than just the story of the Maccabees. One major theme throughout the New Testament is remaining faithful to Christ, especially during times of persecution. We see some examples of that in Matthew 5, 1 Corinthians 4, 2 Corinthians 4 and 9. The book of Revelation speaks specifically to the persecution of believers and what they will face before the return of Christ. Uh, we see that in Revelation 2 as, as well as in Revelation 13. So by keeping the practice of ha uh, Hanukkah and understanding the story of Hanukkah and what the Jews had went through at that period of time, it's going to help prepare you for coming persecutions. So when is Hanukkah? Hanukkah falls in November or December. Uh, of course, since we're using different calendars, there's a bit of a shift. The dates move around because they are based off of the Hebrew lunisolar calendar and not the Gregorian calendar used secularly today. So today we have a Gregorian calendar. Uh, that was not the initial calendar that the Jews were using. Uh, the Gregorian calendar is actually the second Roman calendar, the first one being the Julian calendar by Julius Caesar. Since these calendars don't perfectly align, that's why you see a shift in the dates each year. Hanukkah falls on the 25th of the month of Kislev and then goes on to the 2nd of the month of Tibet. So this year, 2020, Hanukkah is celebrated from December the 10th to December the 18th. And it's always evening to evening. So if you're not familiar, uh, a Jewish day doesn't go from midnight to the start of a new day. The start of a new day is actually the evening. So in some traditions, you'll see six o'clock. Uh, the reason why is because Israel is pretty close to the equator. So six o'clock is 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. That's kind of like breaking the days into halves. Uh, you might find that at 6 p.m. traditionally, uh, you'll find the whole city just shuts down. And now it's time for Hanukkah celebrations. It goes from evening to evening. And the reason why is because in the book of Genesis, every time you read a day in the book of Genesis, it says evening to evening was the first day. Evening to evening was the second day. You have to remember that back in ancient times, we didn't have watches. I mean, let's say we had a solar dial. That's only going to help us during the day hours. But during the night hours, you're not going to know when the middle of the night is. So to try to figure out when midnight is, um, at that period of time, you'd probably have to be a really good astronomer. So nighttime, when you saw the sun set, that was the start of the new day. So the menorah. It is customary to light a candelabra known as a menorah or on Hanukkah in remembrance of the miracle of the oil. On each night of Hanukkah at sundown, that's the new day, as I mentioned, a new candle is lit except for the Sabbath, Friday night, Saturday night. So the Sabbath starts at Friday night. So as soon as the sun goes down on Friday, it's actually technically Saturday. And then until Saturday evening, 
uh, that's the end. So that period of time, you don't light a candle. And the reason why is because in the Old Testament, it's said pertaining the Sabbath that there isn't supposed to be fire that's lit. Uh, so this tradition is obviously kept with the menorah, where the menorah, one of the days of Hanukkah, if you have a Sabbath, you don't light the menorah, you wait till the following day, and then you light the menorah. The process of laying new candles repeated each day until all the candles are lit. So why only seven candles and not eight or nine? So you will actually see some of these menorahs with more or less candles. Seven is what's actually written in the Bible. Uh, I'm actually not a fan of the nine candles, and I'll explain why. And it has to do specifically with the center candle. In 70 AD, when the Romans came in and took the menorah out of the temple and brought it to Rome, the golden lampstand was depicted on a mural on the Arch of Titus. This is the oldest picture of the menorah, and it shows the candle has only seven sticks, not eight or nine. So we can tell in 70 AD, when this Arch of Titus was built, the menorah that was inside of the temple had seven candles. The Bible describes what the golden lampstand looked like, and it only had seven candles, not eight or nine. In Exodus 25, 31 to 36, you get these details. It says, then you are to, play, you are to make a lampstand of pure hammered gold. It shall be made of one piece, including its base and shaft and cups and its buds and petals. Six branches are to extend from the sides of the lampstand, three on one side and three on the other. There are to be three cups shaped like almond blossoms on the first branch, each with buds and petals, three on the next branch, and the same for all six branches that extend from the lampstand. And on the lampstand, there shall be four cups shaped like almond blossoms with buds and petals. For the six branches that extend from the lampstand, a bud must be near the first pair of its branches, a bud under the second pair, and a bud under the third pair. The bud and branches are to be all of one piece with the lampstand hammered out of pure gold. Exodus 25 and 37, make seven lamps and set them on the lampstand so that they illuminate the areas in front of it. The wick trimmers and their trays must be of pure gold. The lampstand and all these utensils shall be made from a talent of pure gold. See to it that you make everything according to the pattern that I showed you on the mountain. So here, the pattern that was given on the mountain was seven lamps specifically. Here we can see an example of a menorah with nine. Uh, the way that this is lit is actually the center candle is supposed to light the other candles. The center candle is called the shamash. And this is where I think the controversy comes in here. Uh, if you've seen nine candles, sometimes they don't refer to this as a menorah at all. It's actually called a Hanukkah. So a Hanukkah has nine candles where a menorah has seven candles and the Hanukkah that ninth candle is used to light the other candles. It's the center candle called the shamash. The reason why I disagree with it is because shamash is mentioned in the Old Testament. Shamash or shimosh, you'll find this actually when you're reading about the story of Abraham and his nephew Lot. Uh, Lot had relations with his daughters. You'll know this after the story of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And then following that, he had two children with his daughters. One child was called Ben-Ami, and this was the child that went on to create the uh, group called the Ammonites. And then the other family was Moab. Moab went on to create the Moabites. So the Ammonites and the Moabites, they had uh, gods that were mentioned in the Old Testament that were different than the God of Israel. Uh, one being Shamash, another one being Moloch. So on the left, we have the menorah. On the right, we have the Hanukkah. This is the one we have with the nine candles. As a matter of fact, here is a quote by Rabbi David Volp. A shamash is the candle that lights the other candles. Be a shamash. Uh, again, this bothers me. And the reason why is because in the Old Testament, you would see the Jews going towards the God of Abraham and then in confusion going towards the gods of other nations. I believe that this uh, tradition involving the shamash actually came from something outside of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the God that they worshipped. I think this had to do with when they were living in some of the other nations in captivity. So I wouldn't be surprised if after Babylon, this practice with shamash took place. As a matter of fact, in 1 Kings 11, 7, we read some details of this. On a hill east of Jerusalem, Solomon built a high place for shamash, the detestable God of Moab, and for Moloch, the detestable God of the Ammonites. He did the same for all of his foreign wives who burned incense and offered sacrifices to their gods. So Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines. So he was definitely marrying uh, women within the outside nations. 
And in doing this, what ended up happening was he started to worship the gods of these women from the other nations. So here we can see pretty early in the times of uh, Israel, uh, the worship of this god Shamash. And Shamash actually shows up for the first time when we're dealing with Lot and his two children, Moab and um, Ben-Ami, which is actually what we see right here when we read about the god of the Ammonites. Shamash, if you take a look, you'll find it in encyclopedia.com. Other names for Shamash would be Utu uh, and Shemosh, spelled C-H-E-M-O-S-H, which is how you actually see it written in the Bible. So Shamash is uh, the newer, more modern way to write it. The older way, at least what you see in the Old Testament in Ge Genesis, is Shamash. And Utu, Utu is a sun god. So it looks like when we're looking at Shamash, Shemosh, Utu, we're dealing with a solar deity. And the fact that it's a candle lighting other candles and we're dealing with a solar deity, it makes a lot of sense how this all kind of got mixed together when we take a look at the two captivities that happened in Judaism. So alternate names again, Utu, Babar, Shamosh. Now the original menorah, the seven, uh, seven candles, it's actually supposed to be designed to look like an almond tree. So when you look at an almond tree and you look at the menorah, you can see they're very similar in regards to how they're constructed. And how did we get the celebration of Hanukkah? Well, Hanukkah, we've already said it's a minor holiday. It lasts for eight days and eight nights. It's primarily a family holiday that is centered around the lighting of the menorah. Each night, a candle is lit. And then holiday foods such as latkes, potato pancakes, that's what the latkes are. They're these kind of, you shred, potato, you shred potatoes and then you add oil and then you fry them. It makes like this kind of a potato -y pancake. Uh, the reason why that the latkes are so, uh, such a traditional meal is because the latkes have oil. And of course, when you have that story surrounding Hanukkah and the fact that the menorah was able to last with one cruise of oil, uh, this is why there's food with oil in it as a reminder. Hanukkah falls close to Christmas. It's become customary to give gifts, often one per night as the candles are lit. Uh, this wasn't originally uh, how Hanukkah was celebrated, but over time, obviously, um, with pressures of surrounding nations, or at least holidays that were being celebrated at the same time, a little bit of overlap happened there where gift giving was commenced with Hanukkah as well. Instead of presents, money is often exchanged. Uh, this is actually called gelt. So children would receive gelt from their elders during the time of Hanukkah. Sometimes one, uh, one donation, maybe over seven days. It just depends on the family and their traditions. And the colors for Hanukkah are blue and white. Uh, the blue, from my understanding, actually came from the Empire of Tyr. So in Tyr, uh, you, you would find that there was these snail shells called the Merlech snail shells. Uh, basically, they would get this Tyrian dye, or Tyrian dyes, where you get the word tie dye. The color purple never existed until the days of Tyr Lebanon, basically harvesting out this uh, this dye out of these snail shells. Just to kind of give you an idea, one gram of purple dye was produced from ten thousand shells. So you can imagine this was a very costly uh, color to produce. This is exactly where royal purple comes from. Royal purple is coming from these snail shells, basically from Tyr. Um, only emperors and, and probably priests would be able to even afford gowns that were made out of these seashells. As a matter of fact, I know that in Rome, I think it was during the Byzantine Empire, there was laws in place that only the leader could wear purple because it was a, a symbol of obviously wealth and prosperity and authority. Uh, speaking of the purple though, that's where the blue came from because the same process that was used to make the purple was a process that was used, I believe it was called Teshlet blue. Uh, that's the color of blue that you see on the Jewish flag, but just a little piece of information there that that color actually came from snail shells that came from uh, Lebanon. What about all the food? That's probably one of the most important questions. What, what, what kind of food is eaten during Hanukkah? It's first off, it's customary to invite family and friends over for dinner every night of Hanukkah. On the first day and the last day of Hanukkah, it's customary to have a huge feast. So you typically eat well all through Hanukkah, but the beginning and the end of Hanukkah, that's when you have your larger feast. So some of the foods you would eat, soups. At every festive meal, matzo ball soup needs to make an appearance. So basically we would make this 
chicken broth. Uh, what my wife does is she actually takes a chicken and then she takes the bones and then she makes her own broth and then she makes her own custom matzo ball soup. It's delicious. In regards to meat, you can really choose any meat dish or vegetarian alternative. Uh, we consume a lot of chicken. We also like to have beef. What we'll do is we'll take beef and we'll put it in the slow cooker. And uh, in the slow cooker, we'll just like let that roast for a while. And that's a typical dish that we have quite often. Uh, it's called beef brisket. Beef brisket is the cut that you would put. You can put a slow cooker. If you have a hot pot, you could do it in there as well. Uh, but that's the beef brisket is a common dish. In regards to bread, challah bread. Challah bread makes an appearance at most holidays and Hanukkah is no exception to the rule. So typically in our household, we have challah bread uh, during the time of Hanukkah and also during Purim. Uh, Purim sorry. We'll take the bread. Uh, my wife actually makes it and then she braids it and then cooks it in the oven. This is obviously not a bread for Passover. Okay, latkes. Latkes are these potato pancakes. Uh, basically what you're doing is you're shredding the potatoes and once the potatoes are shredded, uh, they're cooked in oil. So these are fried potato pancakes made from grated potatoes and served with applesauce or with something sour. So whether you prefer sweet, savory, it's up to you, but uh, we actually serve them with both. In regards to vegetable, this is more of a family tradition. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily call this a Jewish tradition. In our heritage, we also have, or in our family, we have some German heritage. So a staple for our table has been purple fermented cabbage. It's called rotkohl. And last thing we have on the list here is desserts. In regards to desserts, uh, pre excuse my pronunciation, shug <laughs> uh, we've never actually made these here. Uh, we don't really have the supplies to make donuts. However, my wife has made the rugla. The rugla you can see on the right hand side there. Uh, you can make them with chocolates. You could make them with um, nuts. We made this here ones with chocolate with nuts. That's not too difficult to actually make in the home. We will post all these recipes up on the website. What I'll probably do is I'll put a link on the video on the bottom in the comments and I'll just put the details as to where you can find some of these recipes. So thank you for joining me for this Hanukkah presentation. Happy Hanukkah. Uh, thank you for those of you who are joining us. And if you're watching this on YouTube, please give us a thumbs up and subscribe to our videos if you wanna see more great content like this. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of the dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Brothers and sisters, the sword is coming. If you hear the watchman's call, Please repent and seek out Jesus Christ. There is still time. That, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow.